Good morning, everybody. My name is Richard Faluca, owner of Antique Engine Rebuilding. I want to thank you all very much for coming. Uh, before we really get started here, there is one thing. This uh, seminar here is free to you, but it is going to be videotaped, as I had said in the uh, message there. I would appreciate that all of our phones, including myself, go to silent, please, because this is going to be videotaped. So uh, we'd appreciate this very much. Thank you. Uh, afterwards, we will have question and answer for anybody who something wasn't covered or we want to go over something a little bit more in detail. I will be glad to help you out. But again, I do thank you all for coming. What I'm going to be doing today is bringing you through the full presentation of the engine rebuilding from start to finish. I'm going to be going over the babbitting versus the insert bearings. Uh, we're going to be covering a little bit about head gaskets, uh, try to go through the entire engine basically, and fill you all in uh, on what's going on. That's our logo, of course, and oh, there we go. Okay, maybe now we're on. Okay, many of you have not been by the store, or many of you have already, but this is a store, our, my, our, my store, with a short block and a long block out front and of course my panel truck. But we'll be going through into the store and uh, show you how we take engines in. This is basically how we receive them. Uh, all different states, some of them have just come out of cars, some of these as you can see have just been more uh, laid around after they were pulled out of cars. So we get them in all different types of conditions. Uh, a couple of transmissions there, we're not doing as many transmissions as we used to. Most of it now is all the engine wear. Another pile of how they look when they come in. This was a purchase that we did about a year and a half ago. Uh, just a bunch of, you can see there's different states. Some of them have cranks, some don't. There's all different types of engine blocks there. After they're received, we disassemble them. Uh, we run them through a soak tank, which is a caustic soda tank that we have in our shop. Uh, it's environmentally somewhat friendly. Uh, <laughs> It does have a little high alkalinity in it, but uh, so far uh, the EPA, everybody's been cool with that. We don't have a trouble. Uh, it's nothing alarming. Uh, but after they're run through the soak tank, then they go to the sand blaster. Here's another pile of engine blocks that's getting ready to go to the sand blaster. After they go to the sand blaster, they come back and you can see that they have this uh, real light uh, look to them. It's almost like a brand new metal again. Uh, they're cleaned very well. This batch here has already had the caps put on them and etc. But we'll be going through the entire process here of the engine rebuilding and after they're cleaned up, now they're brought back into the shop, we're going to do some crack check and the next thing we're going to be doing is we're going to be counterboring the block for the valve seats. Uh, the tool laying on top of the engine block here is the carbide inserted tool that goes cuts the counter bore in the engine block here. This is a pilot that we use to center the tool here over the engine block over the valve seat so that we're directly center of it. Uh, here you can see as the uh, different view of it as the block has been counterboard. This uh, particular block is being counterboard for the larger intake. You can see that the intake Okay, where's my cursor go? There it is. The larger intake here, is, this is the exhaust, this is the intake, and the intake here is larger. Uh, we do this, uh, our touring engines, which include the counterbalance crankshaft, include the larger intake, where the uh, regular basic engine just has the same size original valves all, all the way through. But uh, we're going to counterbore the block for the insert, uh, they're valve seats. The valve seats that we are using are a hard seat. They're a nickel chrome alloy. So they give a nice uh, valve seat for a stainless steel valve so that everything is compatible. After all the valve seats are installed, uh, we also do checking for the uh, studs. We find that uh, some people have drilled out studs before 
and they don't do it exactly center or whatever and we may have to put a helicoil in the block. When we install a helicoil in the block we have a cylinder head here that has a centering device pin here, a lining pin. This goes into the engine block and centers the cylinder head on the engine block. Then after it's centered we bolt it down with the two bolts anywhere in that any good holes that are in the engine then we run a helicoil tap down through this cylinder head. Uh, every hole in this cylinder head, stud hole in the he cylinder head here, has been tapped for the helicoil tap. So we just run this uh, tap down there and that aligns it straight so the helicoil now is in the exact spot where it should be and of course it's perfectly straight. <coughs> These are the tools that are being used for the helicoil. Uh, we use the first tap, where did my cursor go again? There it is, okay. The first tap here is the taper tap. This one goes down first into the hole so that it uh, will put the starting thread in there and it goes all the way down to the bottom. But one of the deals with the taper tap is it's tapered here at the bottom in order to start to run the thread down into the hole straight and to start the thread to be able to tap it. It does not tap a full thread at the bottom of the hole. So then what we do is we have a bottoming tap and that's exactly what it does. It goes down and it taps the bottom of the thread where it, where it was tapered here, it taps the bottom of that so that you'll get the full length of the thread all the way down. Then we install the helicoil and this is the tool that's used to heal, install the heli helicoil. I see many people who have installed Healy coils and they don't use a bottoming tap. When they don't use a bottoming tap and they install the standard Healy coil, the last thread and a half, two threads of the Healy coil going down into the hole are much smaller because they've hit that taper and they can't get the Healy coil to be right at the right size. It's important to use a bottoming tap and I don't see a lot of people using a bottoming tap today. Here's one that was installed by somebody else. It's just a standard Healy coil in the uh, block. Here's some of the uh, problems that we go through with engine block. You can see that uh, this one here has had a uh, pin put in it and then the crack still continued on. Uh, there are a number of ways that we can still save these blocks. Sometimes it's not worth it, especially if this crack protruded all the way down into the valve port here. It depends how far it went. If it goes down too far, we normally scrap the blocks. It's easier to find another block than it is to repair it. Uh, a lot of times cylinder sleeves can be put in here. Today uh, we've been pinning them from the cylinder sleeve into the valve port here and then we use what is a hot seal. It's a ceramic seal that we put inside the engine and uh, under pressure and it seals up any leaks in there and everything and it does a great job. Saved a number of engine blocks. We'll, we'll run a pin from the cylinder here into the valve port and that will seal it up and then we'll hot seal it. After all the valve seats are installed and the valve guides are installed then we're going to take and we're going to resurface it, the top of the block. We have a old machine here, very straight machine, heavy duty machine uh, it was a wet grinder. It's now been converted to CBN, which is a very hard disc that's uh, a cutter bit, uh, much harder than the carbide, and it does very well cutting the hard seats against the cast iron block. And we can run the machine back and forth and get a very true straight top of the block. Here you can see how we've taken a pass, the difference between the uh, engine block where it's been resurfaced and then of course where it hasn't been. Here it hasn't been resurfaced and on this side yes it's been hit with the stone. Probably needs a little more in detail in here although we don't worry about all the little pitting in some of these areas. We do worry about them if they're in the gasket areas but if it's in the combustion area here a little pitting won't hurt. It doesn't pay to take out all of the pits if they're there. Here you see another view of the engine block. Here is the, the flywheel of the machine and then the cutter bit is right up in here. It's just a little tiny round disc. They call it a CBN. Very hard metal. 
after the top of the block is decked, these engine now will go to cylinder boring. We have a cylinder boring bar that goes on top of the block and clamps down to the uh, engine block uh, to hold it in place and it has three centering fingers that go down into the hole and center it. Uh, you can do it two ways. One is you can center below the ridge of the where, uh, what they call the ridge where the piston rings didn't travel which is your worst wear of the cylinder so that you can offset your bore in a few thousandths one way or another it won't hurt a Model A they've got plenty of room in their head gasket etc like that and uh, you can go ahead and offset the bore and possibly save the engine at a smaller bore size than boring it larger the other way is to center it at the bottom of the bore this gives you true to what it was before you can keep the same thing but most of the time it's the consensus is to bore it at the top to try to save uh, the next size engine boring. Here's a picture of the cutter bit in the boring bar here and if I can get, there's my cursor. Yeah, this is the carbide cutting bit, this is the tool holder. <coughs> These are, there's three fingers here, here and one in the back and this is what does the centering to center the bar into the cylinder to locate it. After the engines are cylinder bored, the next phase that's going to go through will be the align boring. All the caps will be installed on the engine block and in position and they'll be torqued down to the 85 pounds. The engine will then be placed into the align boring machine as you can see here and we have to go into centering the engine block. It is very important to locate exact centers of the engine block so that you will have alignment of the crankshaft towards your transmission number one number two you'll have the correct gear mesh as far as your timing gears go you don't want your gear mesh too tight too loose everything has to be perfectly right down the center we have found out that the bores the saddle bores in the block for the main bearings of the block itself and where the rear seal rides are perfectly original. They are within six tenths normally of original what Ford set the engine block up by the blueprints. So the best way is to center it right off of the saddle bores in the block. And here you can see I'm using a uh, <coughs> dial indicator to measure the sides of the engine and I'll do halfway around. I don't worry about the cap, I worry about the engine block itself. I want to get it centered within two thousandths. Here's what I'm talking about on the rear main. We are going where the seal rides on the back of the rear main. Ah, ah, that, sorry about that. I'm going right here on this surface right here and indicating right off of that where the uh, indicator goes. This is my way of indicating it on the back of the rear main. And again, this surface here has always been within six tenths of the print. Now, after the centering of the block is established, it's tied down, it's sitting in the machine, it has two anchors on the uh, top here and one is behind here that uh, strap it in and then there's two studs that hold it in position. The next thing that's going to be done is the engine block is going to, hitting the wrong buttons here, the, we're going to align bore the bearings. These support arms here and here are adjustable in the machine. They can be moved to any position for uh, went too spec. What am I hitting? I'm hitting something. Sorry about that. And what happens is the arms can be moved wherever I need to do. Right now I always align by the, the number one bearing, one bearing at a time and I do number one bearing first. So what I'm doing here is setting up the arms before and after the first main bearing and then what we'll I'll be doing next, we'll have the cutter bit. Here I am with the cutter bit in the boring bar, which the cutter bit is this piece right here. This is a carbide tip and now it's beginning to enter into the bearing bore, housing bore. After they're all done, you'll do the same to the front, the center and the rear. You open it up and this is what they'll look like after they're bored. They've got a brand new surface and this surface here is now all straight in line, keep hitting the button, there we go, back here, okay. And 
you'll, the surfaces are all in line with here, uh, straight in line, and they have their new finish on it, and the finish will be exactly the OD of the bearing, <coughs> so that now when we put the bearing into there, we will get the exact fit. Uh, normally what we did on our babbitting was we had shims in there so if we didn't get this exact diameter on the main bearings we would add a shim or take off a shim. There's no shims really for the, this purpose here on the inserts. They must, like your modern cars, they all must be align board exactly and right on. We align bore them and then finish them with the little hone three thousandths after. Here you can see the close up of the rear main where we have taken and the rear seal is in the block as well. Here's the rear seal in the block and then here's the bearing cap itself. This is the part of the seal in the cap. This is the part of that's in the block which is a removable piece so that the block can be machined and then this part here in the cap is a non-removable piece that's integral with the engine cap. What I've also done here as you can see we've cut our notches here for the aligning tabs on the bearings, okay? We just use a little uh, uh, grinder and we just grind these in here. Here you can see the center again with the aligning tab has been cut into the bearing here. It's been done on the cap although you can't see it from this view and you can see the nice honed finish on the cap that'll work well with the back of the insert bearings. Here's the front one. Our bearings. Now this is a big thing today. Uh, when Ford made the engine blocks, they were all poured Babbitt. This was probably one of the better metals and better deals that was available at the time. They didn't have the aluminum alloys uh, perfected as well for the engine bearings like they do today. Today, no, we have aluminum engine bearings in most of our cars. And as you see, many of our cars go three, four hundred thousand miles. Uh, the engines are still driving when the cars rotted away. Uh, the aluminum, there's nothing like it. It holds up the best today. There's no doubt about it. The Babbitt bearings of years ago have all been pretty well gone. Uh, the Babbitt material itself has been proven to be too soft for the application. Now what we want to do is we want to put a high compression head on this. We want to drive these engines harder, longer, push them, hard, push them for more than what they were originally designed for. Uh, basically we can get in the car and drive till the gas tank's empty. Uh, couldn't do that years ago. There was always slowing down and you never, they never driv drove it as fast. Today we can put it on the interstate and we can drive these cars. But with the Babbitt bearings, you're going to pound the metal out of them. When I say that, I have a bearing cap here which will be at the back of the room when we're all done. This bearing cap, I don't know, it might be hard to see, but this was a very short lived bearing. Poured Babbitt bearing and it's got the huge fatigue cracks all the way across it, all through it. Pieces are falling out already. And this is a very common thing that we see with Babbitt bearings, whether they're old, whether they're new. It's happening all the time. We see it a lot. This when you go to the insert bearings, this problem is gone. Everything now is much more durable. These bearings are made to handle much higher loads than we can with our 6.1 or even an 8 to 1 head. Uh, these bearings will handle the load. They've taken these bearings out with, uh, to the salt flats, to hill climbs, and they still can't tear the bearings up. It's one of the things that uh, is the reason you want to go to an inserted bearing. Once they're done right, you're using modern motor oils, that job is going to last you. It, it'll be there. Here's our seal. This is the oil seal that's in the back of the block. This is the removable piece I was talking about previously. Uh, we had many troubles with the reproduction ones. Many of them that were original ones were not usable because they were damaged in certain different ways and uh, we couldn't reuse them over. Uh, huge market for it. There was an Argentina one that was on the market and very poorly made. You had to grind it, machine it, and you put it in the block and you couldn't get it to center to the crankshaft. Now we designed our own from the blueprint and this is working out very well. We sell these to Schneiders, Max, Brattons, many of the companies as well. It's not only putting them in every one of our engines, but we're able to sell them to the suppliers as well. 
This is our thrust washers. These are 660 bronze thrust washers that will be installed. There are going to be two of them in the back of the rear main and one in the front of the rear main. The reason for the two in the back of the rear main is the one in the top of the engine block will handle the load very well. We found out it doesn't get oil. If you would take and put a second thrust washer in the back of the rear main, a full circle, now when the oil is leaving the bottom of the rear main, the crankshaft picks it up and lubricates the upper thrust washer and it gets plenty of oil. Here you see the bearing with the seal and the thrust washers installed in the block. And like I say, there'll be another thrust washer installed in the back of the rear main as well. So there'll be a full circle in the back and a half circle in the front. Another view of the block with the cap ready to go together. After the engines are all aligned board, the next step we'll be going through is the honing process. We talked about the cylinder boring before. The cylinder boring takes the stock out of the cylinder. It does not leave a satisfactorily finish for your piston rings at all. Uh, your, if you would try to run your piston rings on that surface, they would wear out pretty quickly. They would not seat well. You would not be happy with the performance or possibly the oil consumption of the engine. So what is done is the, there's a honing process where uh, you put the uh, uh, cylinder hone is run up and down at, while revolving into the engine block. This puts the nice mirror finish on the cylinders. This is the honing tool that is used. It has two wipers and two stones. The wipers hold the hone in position as the stones do the cutting. Here you can see it, the engine is in the machine and the hone is about ready to go down into the cylinder. Here the hone is in the engine block and the fluid is coming in there. You need a constant good wash of fluid. The stones will plug up if we, don't, if we would try to run them dry or anything. You will not get a good uh, uh, finish of it. You need to constantly keep washing this with fluid. Most of other cast iron machining does not require fluids. You see a lot of machining that's been done today on steels and everything. They do require fluids. The cast iron does not require <coughs> fluids. As the honing process goes, we use a dial bore gauge to go down each hole to measure it each at the top, middle, and bottom three times. And we measure each one till we get it exactly to the size that we're looking for. We're always looking for three to three and a half thousandths clearance between our piston skirt and the cylinder wall. And this is what we're always trying to, we mic the pistons and then uh, hone the cylinder accordingly. After the cylinders are all honed, there is a microscopic burrs on it from the honing process. And this is nothing but a carbonized brush that uh, goes down and wipes off these microscopic burrs so that it helps today with our molly rings <coughs> so that our molly rings seat much faster. Less wear on them as well. Here you can see the cylinder wall. You have a nice cross hatch of the honing marks up and down as well. Next we have our crankshafts. Uh, we have three different crankshafts that we are using now in our business. Uh, one of them is the lo lower one is just the regular Model A crankshaft. It's been reground. It does not have any counterweights on it. It's just the basic regular crankshaft. And this is what goes into our basic engine. The middle one there is our welded on weight crankshaft. This one, just what it says, we have weights that are welded onto the crankshaft. Then it is ground and rebalanced. This is standard use in our touring engine. Our touring engine is the counterbalanced engine with the lightened flywheel and the larger intakes. The top crankshaft that you see there is optional, uh, as well as, of course, the touring engine would be. Uh, and the um, top one is the Burlington crankshaft. Yes, these were taken off the market for a while as the previous owner retired from uh, the business. And a new man in Texas has bought the business. And he's turning out the same quality product as well. Uh, a little bit higher price than it used to be, but that's par part to be expected, I guess, as today. Uh, but you're dealing with a brand new crankshaft 
which will have full size standard journals instead of dealing with a welded on weight or a crankshaft that has undersized journals. So it all depends how far you want to go. As far as durability, our welded on weights has held up very, very well over the last decades. Uh, the new ones are holding up as just as well, but some people like to have all brand new parts and we do offer that as well. Here's some different view of the crankshafts where you can see the front of them. The top one has not got any marks on it where you, it's been underground where you can see the other ones are reground crankshafts. They have marks 20 thousandths on the lower one and 10 thousandths on the center one. Afterwards the crankshaft is installed into the engine block. Here you see the engine, the, this would be the Burlington crankshaft installed in the engine block and I would be working now to install a thrust washer right in here in the, in the block to fit this so that the crankshaft will have the proper end plate. These are fitted together with a zero to one clearance when they go together. They'll break in, they'll usually have about three thousandths clearance after they break in a little bit. The thrust washers in the engine block are never affixed or attached to the engine block in any way, mean or manner. They're basically floating in there. When you pull the crankshaft out, the thrust washers will basically fall on the floor. The thrust washer should never be affixed as this will cause end loading on them and premature wear. Uh, when they're floating in there, it doesn't cause this wear and it's been proven over the years, this is the way to do it. They're never attached. The front one, the cap holds it from rotating where the rear one, we do need to install a dowel pin in the thrust washer to keep it from rotating only. It's a loose fit dowel pin, it doesn't adhere to anything, it's not attached to, only attached to the thrust washer, not attached to the engine block. Camshafts, uh, all of our camshafts, which would be the lower one, are, oh, oh, sorry about that, are the reground camshafts. Uh, these have the same lift as the regular Model A with a little longer duration on it. Should a person want to have a little more camshaft, we do offer that as well. We offer the 330 camshaft, which would be pictured here. The 340 looks exactly the same as the 330. The 330 was by the manufacturer, uh, specialty camshafts would be used for the updraft carburetor system. They say the 340 would be used for the downdraft carburetor systems. Uh, I find out no matter what, I like the 330 best. I see higher compressions. Uh, I do like the performance of the 330 even on a downdraft carburetor. Supposedly you have 10 more thousandths lift, but they've increased, it, increased the duration on the 340 as well, and you're getting a little bit too much valve overlap in my eyes and a little bit lower compression. I prefer the 330 camshafts all the way around in my preference, if you're going moving up to a newer camshaft. Timing gears, we have our own timing gears now. Uh, these were developed all from the Ford print. Yes, they are made overseas. They're exactly right made to the print though, they're right on. We have a gauge which is at the back of the room if you, anybody wants to inspect it. And this uh, gauge here, calls for the exact dimensions from center to center and then the gears are placed on here and you can measure that they do have their two to three thousandths backlash when they're installed over the pins. Our valves, our valves are all of a modern style valve package. They, as I said, we do offer the larger intake. We have a cast iron guide that presses into the engine block along with the <coughs> machine that goes in after that, and then our stainless steel valves. All of our other valves would be stainless steel. We have a very heavy duty valve that uh, has been proven very well to wor work very satisfactorily. Never hear of anybody burning out any valves in my engines. Uh, we did have a couple of them where they bent valves, which I don't completely understand because they were using the larger intake valve and using it with the regular cylinder head. I don't completely understand the purpose of put going to a large valve without uh, putting on the high compression head. The high compression head should be the first thing I would want to do to upgrade the engine uh, besides the inserts. And uh, yeah, the valve has a chance to hit the cylinder head. Not all in all applications, but in some applications the valve can hit the cylinder head. 
and we've seen two valves that were bent because they hit the cylinder head. Not exactly our fault, we do have a, a note for that in, the, uh, in our instruction sheets. And here you can see the difference, there are 200 thousandths difference between the standard valve and the large intake. There's also samples at the back of the room if you'd like to see them before you walk out the door. Next is our connecting rods. Our connecting rods are made in the USA. Our bearings are not unfortunately, they don't make any aluminum lined bearings in the USA, none at all. Uh, but the connecting rods, the bolts, the bushings, everything there as far as the connecting rod go is all made in the USA. Right here in the Chicagoland area, they're forged by Modern Forge which has now moved to Indiana. And then they're machined in Broadview, Illinois and I'm the only one who has the uh, contract with them to sell the USA made connecting rods. There are foreign connecting rods on the market. You might want to check them out before you go to those as they do have a Babbitt lined bearings where ours are aluminum lined bearings. And the Babbitt still even in a lined bearing has not proven to be successful. They have been proven to fatigue out. Our oil pump kits. Uh, we have our own oil pump kit with the cut down shaft at a very economical price compared to many of the other kits out there as well. The st step down shaft does help improvement. It depends on your oil pump how much it's going to up the improvement of the pump. The oil step down shaft is mandatory on the Model B engine oil pump. And here is the bushings for the oil pump. Cylinder heads. We are basically discontinuing now the 5.5 head in our store. Uh, we're finding out that for $65, uh, why bother stocking the two heads? The top one there is the 6.1, the lower one is the, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The top one is the 5.5, the lower one is the 6.1. Uh, when Schneiders first came out with the 6.1 many years ago, they did have a couple of instances with it. Uh, with the manufacturing and a couple of different issues. I sold a bunch of them, never had a trouble with any of them. Uh, they had <coughs> since had some trouble when they went to manufacture the second batch. Now they've got that all aced out. Their 6.1 head is really the top of the line head as far as I'm concerned. If you're looking for a cylinder head that looks original. If you don't care for about the originality and you're looking for a little bit more performance on it, the lion head is a very, very nice cylinder head, gives you a lot better performance. Uh, the trouble is acquiring them. Uh, it's at their wishes when they have them in stock. And um, it, sometimes it's just hard to get them. Uh, but the 6.1 to me is a nice head, especially if you want to keep it looking in the original fashion. Here's the outside of the head. You can see they both look the same. Here's the short block. Uh, there are, what we're talking about, short block, long block, uh, many people are confused. We're talking about the same engine. It's still a Model A engine. It's not more cylinders, less cylinders. It's still the basic Model A engine. But the short block is the engine block with all the internal parts in it, meaning the pistons, the rings, the valves, the connecting rods, the camshaft, the timing gears, the valve train, everything is in there and adjusted ready to go. It does not, short block does not include anything mounted externally. No head, no pan, no valve cover, no clutch, no pulley. Nothing mounted externally. The short block is the engine block with the parts in it only. Some people have been confused that they think it's a bigger block or nothing. It's the same. It's how much you want us to build the engine versus how much you want to put together yourself. Here's another view of the short block. This is the short block. This one has the larger intake as you can see. Here's the view of a engine block. This one is now being built up to the long block. The gaskets are in place. The oil pump is not in it yet. But you can see how we do this. There is a sealer at the uh, front of the engine block here. We have the blue RTV sealer on the outside edge of the donut. We are no longer using the packing on that originally was designed for it. Packings are made to leak. We've had exceptionally good luck with the front seals uh, come from um, South Carolina or come from Georgia. 
We were getting them from New York. We had a lot of trouble with the front seals. The ID of the front seal boot was actually too small and it was actually hitting the, crank, the shaft of the pulley. And as soon as the boot hit the pulley, the boot heated up and took the seal out as well. Uh, we switched manufacturers now and our problems are gone with this front seal. The, this one is a very good, they're working very, very properly now, very successfully. Here's the long block now with the exception of the cylinder head and it wouldn't have the flywheel on it as of yet. But the cylinder head you can see the gaskets on it, head studs are in it and it's getting ready to go on. One of the things we talk about gaskets now. Uh, many of us have been familiar with years, over the years, with the gasket that has the red silicone on it, okay? Uh, we used this for many years with some problems. Uh, lately, we were, or about two years ago, we were having tremendous amount of problems. I mean, probably 50% of gaskets failing. Customers were always reporting, I torqued it, I torqued it, but gaskets were failing all the time. We were just having a terrible time with it. Uh, I have that gasket on two of my vehicles for years, never had a problem with it. Other people were reporting problems from time to time. It was a nuisance. Uh, we have now switched to the best gasket. It is a graphite self-sealing gasket. Best gasket number 573 is the B style. It works very well on the A style engine as well. Uh, so we only have to stock the one gasket. Uh, it's a self-sealing gasket, meaning you do not need any adhesives, sealants, or anything like that to put the gasket on there. Uh, I'm a little bit confused. I have not been able to figure it out because the manufacturer now says a product like Hitech should be used on their gasket. Well, if it's a self-sealing gasket and then you use a product like Hitech, how does the self-sealing work? Because now the sealing part can't get to the iron and bond itself. These gaskets are made to heat up, and when they heat up, they bond to the iron, the head or the block. And they do. If you put this gasket on even one time, heat, warm up the engine, pull it apart, you'll see the gasket start to rip. The longer that this gasket stays on there, the more it's going to seal itself on there. And to me, these gaskets now are the ones we're using. Uh, not only because they're not blowing, but also they're a thinner gasket than the red silicone ones. The thinner gasket now will help us raise up the compression, get a little bit more performance out of the engine, which is something that, uh, yeah, we're all looking for. We want nice performance out of it. We do want to make the car go. We don't need to be the fastest guy on the block, but of course we want a nice performing engine. One of the other things that we do do, uh, you can barely see it here on the top of the engine block, <coughs> is where the studs go in. We put on the coarse shoulder, a little bead of RTV. We screw the studs all the way down into the engine block and with this coarse bead, bead of RTV on the coarse shoulder and then unscrew them one full turn. This gives you about one and a half threads above the top of the nut. If the studs today are screwed all the way down into the engine block and you put the nuts on there, the top of the stud will be about a thread and a half below the top of the nut. We're looking to have it about a thread and a half above the top of the nut. So we unscrew the studs, it won't hurt anything, and then uh, put the uh, cylinder head on there and try to adjust it so that all of your nuts are about a thread and a half, up. the stud is a thread and a half above the nut. Here now you see it with the flywheel and the cylinder head on it. This would be the long block. We talked about the short block before. This would be the long block. This would have the head, the pan, the valve cover, the timing case cover, flywheel, flywheel housing. Oil pump has been rebuilt. It has a new pulley on it, new spring and plunger, new intermediate oil pump drive gear. All installed, ready to go. When you're in Chicagoland, do recommend, please come in, visit us. We'll be glad to give you the nickel tour through the store. Any questions? Lindy is asking what material the timing gear is, and that's a macerated material from the timing gear. Very strong, it holds up very well. Ron, Ron is asking about the new gasket antifreeze leak. The worst gasket as far as antifreeze leak is definitely the Felpro copper, and I hate to say that because Felpro, which is now 
the uh, federal mogul company is right here in Skokie. That's probably the worst one. Yes, it's an, a, a nice sandwich gasket. It leaks the worst as far as streamers down the outside of the block. The silicone one is less, and I, I tell you today, even the, uh, these composition gaskets leak even less. If, by chance, with any of the gaskets that you do have streamers down the outside of the block, curtain laces, they look horrible, I agree. I would highly recommend having the engine warm, put a half a vial of block sealer in there, and run the engine. Yes. And that'll, that'll run it for at least a half hour. Yes. I'm sorry yes. about that. Painting and, and oil I didn't mention either. Okay. Painting, uh, we just use a spray can here. Uh, everything is primed and then painted just in our shop right there. We don't have a spray booth or anything. It's not a fancy spray booth but, uh, or fancy system, but it has worked out very successfully. We, our oil pans are painted black and my man's putting a nice finish on the oil pans as well as the engine blocks as well. You can, you can see there. The oil, I want, oh, sorry, I wanted to mention about the oil as well. Today's modern motor oils, uh, if you look on them, they should all have the SN, what we want to use for a Model A. Uh, there is thoughts of if it's an old engine, uh, we wouldn't want to use a multi-grade motor oil because of the fact that it's a high detergent oil and if there are dirts in the engine, they'll circulate, could cause damage. Uh, I'm going to go back and I'm going to override that and I'm going to say in any engine today, even my panel truck out there has never lost connection again. Sorry. Let's see if it comes back. Sorry. Well, the panel truck uh, out there has got the original engine in it. The pan has never been off of that engine as well. I'm still running modern motor oils. I would highly recommend any engine today, you're going to use the modern SN motor oils, preferably the 5W30. Uh, I, I like it the best. Um, we say the SN. Why? Aluminum bearings is what we're doing in our engines today. They will require the SN factor. Okay. Uh, the additives that are in the oil work very well. If you decide to override that and say, well, I want to use this oil or this oil, there have been pro uh, oil problems we have seen from people not using the proper oil in the engine. We are highly recommending the SN oil 5W30. On the other hand, um, people say, what about the zinc content of the oil? There is no zinc in the SN factor, or very, very little zinc at all. Okay? And I agree that the zinc factor on a cast iron camshaft with flat tappets is very, very essential. Uh, you need this zinc factor. Now, the Model A has a steel camshaft. That whole scenario is gone completely wiped out. It has a flat tappet, but it's on a steel camshaft. The whole scenario of wiping out the lobe on the camshaft has gone away. Never seen a steel camshaft ever have any damage from no zinc in it. Don't worry about it. You don't need your Rotella oil. Buy your 5W30, 10W30 modern motor oils. It'll work just great. Sorry about that. Russ, Russ is asking about pistons. The pistons now we're using in our engines are our own pistons. They are manufactured overseas for us. They are graphite coated. They are very close to original weight. They're not as close as we want them yet. Well, what we were trying to do was have that our pistons be equal in weight whether you bought a 145 thousandths oversize or you bought a standard. It would be equal in weight to the original pistons. Uh, they haven't got this squared away yet. Uh, we are selling the pistons that we do have right now in our engines only. We do have standards available over the counter, but the rest of them we don't have enough to supply us till we get our new supply of engines and our pistons. And hopefully our new supply will be as designed. They'll have a lug inside the piston that will be machined more for the standard pistons and then less for the 145. So each piston will be exactly the same way. And they use all the narrow ring packages, which what, what we want today, because we're converting it now to a Molly ring with a narrow ring package, which gives us extremely long life on our cylinder walls. Dale is asking about synthetic oil. As far as synthetic oil goes, it has been proven very, very well that it will cause less wear on the parts. 
The problem is the less wear to the financial replacement of the engine has not proven successful. And there's not enough no difference between the wear and the amount of the oil. The oil is too expensive for that much amount of wear that happens. It's, it, they, the amount of wear is very minimal between using synthetic oil and a mineral oil. And they've been proving it now that yes, you're just paying to have the rights to, ha to say that yes, I'm using a synthetic oil. And it's been proven uh, over that way. If, but again, if it makes you happy, yes, use your synthetic oil. I do recommend at least though using your, your you know, the 5W30 modern style. Don't, don't use a straight weight or anything like that. That's all the uh, method bearings in it. Yeah, well, Babbitt bearings, it doesn't matter. We don't care what bearings in it. The today's modern oils is what you want to keep using in there. Yes. David is asking about the oil filler cap on the engine causing a rear main leak. What happens on that is the crankcase needs to vent. And that's why that cap is designed not to seat itself all the way down. If the stops on the cap get bent or broken, the oil filler cap will seat itself all the way down onto the oil filler tube and it virtually seals the crankcase. If the crankcase cannot breathe, it, it has pressures in there. These pressures will then force oil out the back of the rear main and any other place it can find it. You may f find leaks that don't show up, but now with that pressures in there, you'll find it pushing oil. Let's say out of a thread of a timing case cover bolt, it won't normally leak, but with those pressures in there, it'll leak. But ba basically, it'll throw it out the back of the rear main. Uh, easy way to diagnose this problem. You say, well, I don't know if the caps, I don't know what the cap should look like underneath or anything like that. Very easy way to diagnose the problem. Take the oil filler cap off of the engine, put it on your workbench, take the car for a drive. If it quits leaking out the rear main, it's your oil filler cap. Bill, good question, thank you. Bill is asking about the aftermarket oil filter on the engines. Uh, I really think that the aftermarket oil filter is a very, very excellent piece, very effective working, cleaning the engine, keeping, let's say, longer life, because if we're going to keep the engine parts cleaner, I do feel there's going to be longer life on our engines. We know that one of the problems with bearings and piston wear in every part of the engine is the dirt that gets in there, and definitely we don't have the emissions in a Model A to keep it clean like we do in a modern car. The oil filter is a very, very effective, efficient system. I like the full flow system that mounts on the valve cover. Uh, they call it the affordable filter. One of the issues that I have a hard time dealing with is in my personal life, I cannot stand the sight of a alternator or an oil filter on my Model A. <laughs> this is my Model A. Now I'm gonna tell you, build the car that makes you happy. If you, if you say, hey, I drive it more, I'm more worried about night for my, uh, so I want an alternator. Uh, I, I can get longer life out of my engine by running an oil filter. Fine. I sell the oil filters. I sell the alternators. I don't want to be a hypocrite, but I sell you, build a car that makes you happy. You don't have to build a car that suits your friends. You build a car that makes you happy. Many people have done that. Yeah, Ron is asking about the color of the oil filter. And there are blue ones and red ones and all kinds of different colors. And it, of course, it's very easy to paint it black. Well, yes, it should be painted black to be co color coded with the engine because as we know, the cast iron is painted green, sheet metal is painted black on the Model A engine, and the oil filter would be a sheet metal piece, so yes. Yeah, Jeremy is asking about parts on the long block if we're using the customer's or his. Uh, we use the customer's part if they turned in their engine. If they're taking a stock, well then of course they come from our stock engine and then we do an exchange on it because we sell the engines outright or, I, I'm sorry, we sell the engines exchange or we rebuild the customer's engines because many people have the original number that goes with their frame license and title. We don't want to disturb that. I kind of like to keep it the same myself if it was my vehicle. So we will rebuild your engine. The crankshaft, the camshaft, Main bearing caps and nuts, no, those all go in a pile. They're all going to be mixed up. I, it, that's the way we do it. But the, all the other parts, the timing case cover, the oil pan, flywheel housing, all those parts, you will get your own back. Uh, we did have a oil contamination on one. And definitely it was oil contamination throughout the entire, entire engine. The engine it had a um, oil contamination. When you see an oil contamination, uh, all the parts in it 
have a real dull gray silver look, a grayish look, and the, the, the shine, the sheen off of all the parts is gone. And we definitely knew it was oil contamination. And today, it's not a problem. These oil uh, analysis people are giving some great deals on them. If we would ever suspect that, if we get a sample of the oil, we can prove it. What's the life expectancy of the motor then? We don't know. We've got them out there for oh, we've got them out there for over a hundred thousand miles already. So well, I don't really know how long they can last. Sorry, DJ. DJ is asking about dyno testing, and no, we do not have a dyno in our shop. We can test run the engines in our shop, but we do not have a dyno for it. Jerry, yes, we do. We have reground camshafts, which were in the photo. That was the lower one. Those are reground with the same lift as a regular Model A but then a longer duration on it. And then we offer the new camshafts either way. Tom, I kind of feel so. The only thing that I would, or Tom is asking about water jacket cracks on the outside of an engine that have been welded, if the engine would be usable. Uh, he has matching numbers. He wants everything to try to go to the same again. And in this instance, I would say, Tom, how bad does the weld look? You know, uh, can we grind it down? Can we smooth it into the engine? Uh, we have pressure testing to tell us if the weld was good, if it still leaks, if there's anything like that. So in that instance, I go, I always like to try to keep matching numbers the same. We would always investigate it. I'm thinking if it's big globs of welding and it caused lots more cracks, I'd say, you know what, let's, let's skip this. Let's try to find, let's go into a different engine block. If we can grind it down and make it look decent for you, well, let's go for it. We do, uh, Tom is asking about engine serial numbers. We do restamp engine numbers. We charge $25 for that. We'll put any number on there that you request. We do write it on the receipt that we restamp the engine to such and such number. Art is asking about resleeving engines or the largest bore size we have. The largest bore size we have right now is 145, which is working out very successfully. Uh, not even hitting the gaskets. Everything is clear. Uh, we can resleeve an engine. I find out it's pretty expensive. Right now it's running about $500 extra. A lot of times you can find another block for under that. Steve is asking about fuel and fuel additives. The uh, fuel additives today are not necessary at all. Uh, never felt they were. There was a lot of people concerned about the no lead gasoline. Uh, there was a big panic years ago about it and I gotta get this additive in there or my engine's gonna die and I'll have all kinds of valve problems and everything. Nothing ever happened in an automobile engine from the no lead gasoline. There were reports of problems from industrial engines and severe use engines such as bolts. There was never problems with valve recession in a Model A or any other antique car, any old uh, cars. Uh, as far as additives go, I don't believe we need any fuel additives today. You're asking as far as the Babbitt bearings versus inserts as far as taking it down and reshimming it. There are no shims on the insert bearings, and no, you do not need to readjust bearings or anything like that. Everything should be set and stay there from the get-go. That is a real tricky question. Uh, asking as far as oil changing today, uh, how intervals, it's a real tricky question. I don't have an, engine, uh, an answer for that. I find most people are going about a season, depending how many miles you drive in a season. Um, I, I don't really have an answer. I do know today's motor oils are lasting much longer. If we really wanted to get advanced on this oil uh, deal as far as how long the intervals, especially with a filter, without a filter, does it have a carburetor intake filter or not, all these things would matter as to how long our oil life would last. Uh, what we would have to do is put us, uh, uh, change the oil in the vehicle drive it for X amount of miles, send it into the oil analysis and see how they say. And I'm thinking, I don't know who's going to keep sending because you're going to have to send it in at different intervals on the same life of oil and uh, it's going to be an involved procedure. Most people are changing it uh, once a season. As far as today goes, I don't see in the inserted bearings especially that I don't see where oil is really, as long as they're using the 5W30, 10W30, I don't see any real problems with the dirt in there, so people must be changing it enough to keep the engine clean. The, is, Ray is asking for the piston weight of, of our pistons compared to the original. Our standard piston is equal in weight 
to the original piston. I forget what the weight was, 580 grams, something like that. Uh, our piston is now equal to that weight at standard, but as we went through the larger sizes, our piston got heavier. Uh, we are trying to alleviate this system by putting the lug inside the piston that would be machined so each piston would have the same weight. Same, okay. Right. The, this will still be a little while before the next batch of pistons come out. That's one of the reasons we're not selling our pistons now over the counter is we still need them for the engines that we're doing right now. No, uh, he's asking about Glipdol to the inside which is a coating that's installed in the, uh, or coated on the inside of the engine. And uh, I think this is, as far as the Glipdol coating, it's basically for aircraft use. I don't see any automob automobile doing this at all. Yes, Bob, the, uh, Bob is asking about the prices of the engines. Uh, the <coughs> basic short block starts out at 2200 the Turing short block is now at 3200 the basic long block with the 5.5 I'm sorry 6.1 head is 3515 and then the Turing long block with the 6.1 head is 4550 and there are flyers at the back of the room that please help yourself and the prices on their bat in the back yes you're asking about the valve seats all of our engines would have nickel chrome alloy valve seats regardless intake and exhaust. And you might ask, why do you do that to every one of them? Well, our basic reason is most of the time people have gotten to the engine before us and ground the seats too low in the block. Not the wearer from the gasoline, it's people have ground it too low. We can actually see where they machine it too low into the block. It's not wearing and uh, we say you know what let's just put hard seats in everything all the way across that alleviates any situation and we don't get into a borderline well this does need seats or doesn't we put hard seats all the way across it builds a better engine all the way around right a asking about a addit the additive for stopping the curtain laces on the dripping of the cylinder head on the outside of the block and that would be any type of a block sealer, like a bars leak or the copper powder filings. Uh, you can buy this at Walmart, Kmart, any of the auto supply stores. Just a block sealer. When the engine is warm, water's circulating good, you dump a half a tube of that in there, drive the car around for a half hour, and it seals up the curtain laces on the outside of the block. Seals up any little por porosities. It's actually a radiator <coughs> sealer, block sealer, but it works great for those head gaskets to seal up those porosities. On the multi-disc clutch, Steve is asking about the lightening of the flywheels on the multiple disc clutch. We do not rebuild the clutches on the multiple disc because, of course, parts are not available for it. And actually, most of them just seem to be okay. Some of them have locked up, which can be freed back up again. Um, as far as the flywheel goes, yes, we can lighten the flywheel for the multiple disc clutch system. I did have, a, excuse me, you're asking about valve seats coming loose. I did have a valve seat come loose many, many years ago, but we're very careful today with our tooling and everything to make sure that we've always got your 5 to 5.5 press fit on a valve seat. We're very careful. And once you got that, you're cool. Yes, the connecting, connecting rods were taken from a 1936, the prints were taken from a 1936 print from the Ford Motor Company on insert bearings. There was a few modifications that we did to it, but basically it was the same as the 1936 Ford print. And that's why our rods are equal in weight, everything like that, to the original Ford print. Right, you're asking about the 28 five bearing camshaft. We have the 28, we get them reground, the, the 28 camshafts, we get them reground. And we normally, if it has a five bearing camshaft block, we always put a five bearing camshaft in there. And then <coughs> afterwards, from the five bearing camshaft, uh, they had a lot of the five bearing camshafts left over, but they weren't producing that bearing in the block. And uh, you'll see where the center two bearings are smaller OD. They're, uh, they're on the camshaft, but they're smaller OD. Just one of the successions of the block that it went through. Asking about the running en engine option. Yes, we do build the running engines. It runs Right now it's running $1,650 more to the price of the long block. No, we do not rebuild the carburetor or manifolds or anything like that. The carburetor, manifolds, uh, all put on new. Water pump is new. The distributor will be rebuilt with the later style Ford points in there on, on the upper plate. 
it will have the uh, new water pump, the starter will be built with the new Bendix, new switch on it, the generator will be built, or we can put an alternator on there if you prefer an alternator. Uh, all the new ignition system, etc., and we will actually run and start it up and run it in our shop. But the manifolds carburetor we will not reuse. We use new. Asking about retorquing the head. As far as I'm concerned, basically every time we take it out of the garage in the in the springtime, it doesn't hurt. When you change your oil, it doesn't hurt to retorque the head. Am I a follow one of the follow? No, uh, I guess the. Cobbler's kids go without the shoes, you know. I don't always do that myself. But I would always think it's a good idea just to retorque it every spring when you take it out. Hot or cold? Have, asking about retorquing the head hot or cold. I have not heard a di or seen actual difference between hot and cold. We've tried torquing it hot, we then go back and check it when it's cold, back and forth. I cannot find a difference. I say just retorque it. Lindy is asking about backing off and then retorquing it or just retorquing. I think just retorquing it is fine. If you put your torque wrench on there and you have a snap torque wrench and it goes up to your 60 pounds, just leave it there. I don't believe it's necessary to back it off. Don is asking about cam bores in the block. Uh, we've, uh, we do do this. It's a very expensive venture. Uh, I've scrapped blocks because it wasn't worth uh, boring the cam bearings out as far as that goes. Um, we can do it. I, we try to avoid it. Uh, one of the ways of doing it today, though, uh, is put a brand new cam in there because that will help take up a lot of the slop if the block is severely worn. If we can save it that way, otherwise, yeah, we can put cam bearings in it or scrap it and start over. And the horse holder? Yeah, the, the V8 has a cast iron camshaft. Okay. Yeah. Although, I'm going to go back and I'm going to say you have very low valve spring tensions in that V8 engine compared to you know your cars in the 60s and 70s uh, and it's okay uh, but the higher valve spring tensions yes it could cause damage and you do have a cast iron camshaft in the uh, early v V8 Fords so you know in that instance yeah the scenario of the steel camshaft is gone away for you 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 have the cast iron camshaft so yes you probably want to have a zinc additive in there Bob is asking turnaround time. Normally it's four to six weeks. Right now we're getting down to that. We're just coming out of five to seven. We're getting back down to the four to six week turnaround time. Asking about exchanges or reversing your bill. We, we, we do do exchanges all the time. One of the issues that we're having right now is I don't have exchanges on the floor. We put you on the waiting list and we build it up as, as it comes. Uh, I would like to be able to have them on the floor someday, but right now we're just so busy. It's always a four to six week wait, and we put you on the list and build you up one as just as we pop fast as possibly can. But otherwise, we rebuild your engine or exchange either way. I don't. David is asking about visiting the shop without disrupting the work. I don't know that there is a way, but please come in. We only just, we'll spend a few minutes with you. We'll walk you through the shop. We'll let you see the equipment. We'll let you see what's going on at that particular time. I'm not embarrassed of my shop. Is it the cleanest in the country? Probably not. Is it the worst in country? I know it's not. <laughs> You're asking about the modifications to the engine is changing the tone of the engine to sound like the original. And that is, there's not a modification in there that you can do right now that we offer that will change that. The radical camshafts will change that, yes. But as far as the regular camshaft, our new camshaft, None of that is going to change it. The cylinder head, it's still going to sound like the basic regular Model A. So the touring package versus... Uh, With the larger intake, all that stuff, nothing is going to change. Downdraft carburetors can help change that, that scenario. The updraft carburetors don't change it. The camshafts don't change it. None of, unless you go to a radical camshaft. I don't really offer radical camshafts. Asking about the speeds on the touring engine. Uh, basically what it does is the counterbalance crankshaft in that, your normal Model A with a basic engine tours at about 45, 47 miles an hour and with the touring package on the engine you're bringing that up to about 53 to 55 miles an hour. Overdrive is then your next step to get the, yeah. Bill uh, asking about operating temperatures for the engine. I have not really seen engines that run at a constant temperature uh, as far as that goes I've seen some people some of them run as low as 160 some of them are running as low as 180 uh, I'm not a real thermostat 
advocate unless of course you're driving a lot driving a lot in the winter time uh, but otherwise I don't uh, I don't even have a temperature gauge on my own car never overheats I don't really see ever a problem with it but I really can't give you a good I mean theoretically if we could keep keep it at 185 perfectly all the time that would be the best but it doesn't always work that way yes any other well, I want to thank you all for coming very, very much. I appreciate it. Thank you for being on our video.